The final O'Donnell Awardee presentation is by Mr. Eschers Partush from Schlumberge. Mr. Partush is a program manager for the Aura Intelligent Wireline Formation Testing Platform at Schlumberge. Mr. Partush was chosen for the Valbor Formation Testing Technology Platform he helped develop, which is in use globally in the energy industry. Mr. Partush, I'd like to invite you to the podium. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Uh, it's uh, a great privilege to present uh, what I worked on for the last 10 years, and um, difficult to go after all this great presentation <laughs> that has been coming, so hopefully uh, you'll find it as well entertaining. So, thanks for having me on this one. So today I will present to you uh, Aura, the next uh, generation uh, one information tester that we developed at Chambergé. Uh, I was previously the program manager overseeing the development of this technology. So before um, I go into the detail of the technology, I just want to take a step back and bring you to what is formation testing and why do we do formation testing in oil and gas. So formation testing is typically done after you drill a well uh, to be able to get some information about the reservoir that has been drilled to know um, the type of oil that you have, the type of formation, and essentially to assess how likely it is that you would be able to produce hydrocarbon from it. And, and you, as you can see on the sketch, uh, as you can see on the sketch, typically we have a probe that will engage with the formation and needs to connect, and we will start drawing pressures, and from the pressure reading, we can elaborate what is essentially the permeability, how easy, it, how easy it would be for the fluid that's in that rock to move and be produced. And we can also uh, produce that rock um, to then analyze it in situ and bring it back to surface for further analysis. And why this is important? So you can see here, um, palette of uh, people in oil and gas from the geologists or reservoir engineers that would be interested in knowing what does the reservoir does so they can put them in their model and then help predict um, the viability of the reservoir, how much uh, they will be able to produce. From the fluid data that we get, the completion uh, team and facility team will know, you know how it, what is the best way to produce it and uh, to bring it to uh, facilities. So this technology has to operate in a various uh, set of environment, from rocks that could go from unconsolidated sand or you know, really literally beach sand, uh, sandstone, uh, carbonates, and basement rock. So from a very soft material to very hard material, um, we will have to engage with what we call drilling fluids. So this is the, um, the, the fluid that is used to help drill the formation, and we'll have s most of the time a lot of solid in them, um, and we'll create what we call mud cake that helps seal the well bore, but also create challenges for us as we operate those tools to be able to access the formation. We need to sample fluids from the heavy oil all the way to the gas condensate and, 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 and dry gas, so a wide range of fluid needs to be manipulated. And the uh, environment itself from high pr from, uh, in terms of pressure and temperature can also vary from uh, relatively low temperature to the high uh, temperature that we find in uh, Southeast Asia, for example, where it can be over 400 degrees Fahrenheit um, to pressures of 2,000 PSI, 5,000 PSI in the Middle East, all the way to uh, 30, 31,000 PSI in the Gulf of Mexico. So we have to operate in these conditions with the same tool successfully. So just to take you a step back and just to reinforce the fact that this is not, in terms of uh, principle, it's not new, right? This formation testing has been there since the, almost the beginning of oil and gas. Uh, I could go back all the way to the early 30s where there was the first drill stem test where they tried to produce an, uh, uh, um, a reservoir for analysis purposes. But I will focus on what we call the one line formation testing. So these are conveyed, two conveyed on a cable that carries telemetry and power. And in the early 50s, um, you know, late 50s, let's say, um, the capability was purely to be able to read pressure. So you set it, it will be one time, set it against the formation. Uh, you create a depression and then you read pressure. As time evolved, we went to, now we want to do more, we want to be able to do it multiple times so we can test multiple zones in the, in the, in the reservoir interval. So here came the reservoir liquid formation tester. And in the 1990s, um, uh, somewhat of a revolution where now not only we were able to 
take pressure measurement, which was mostly the focus you had before, but now you would start to say, okay, now I want to be able to capture fluid samples from the rock formation. And eventually from uh, 1990s with the modular planning test, there was many innovation that came in uh, to first be able to uh, capture the samples, analyze the sample down or in situ, um, and flow the sample uh, efficiently. Uh, which leads me to how we also connect to the formation with different types of instrument. Uh, from a small probe that's about this thing, in di this about this in diameter, to large balloon type, we call them packers, dual packers, balloon that we set across the reservoir with large interval. This is what was used usually for very low mobility formation when you, are, uh, you have to really have a large surface area to produce. Um, then you have focus probe, and I have a slide that will cover on that, and then the 3D uh, radio probe as well that we'll cover in more detail. And in 2019, three years ago, uh, we came with the next evolution of formation testing, which is the Aura Intelligent Formation Tester, which uses a lot of the knowledge that was done over the last you know, 50 years, 60 years uh, uh, of improvement, and, and try to make it, uh, to combine that in a single tool uh, to provide much more efficient solution. So what is Aura? So Aura is our latest formation testing platform, and it's rated to 200 degrees C and 35,000 PSI. So we cover as far as we can get in thermal environment, so we are able to access all the different type of uh, reservoir information. It has an optimized architecture with built-in automation. So in all, in all of these tools, we've embedded several microchip computers to be able to do automation and en enhance the operation of, of the tool. Uh, we have download lab accuracy uh, lab accuracy grade uh, sensors, um, including the first in the industry uh, resistivity sensor, so we can actually measure a calibrated resistivity of water down all in situ, as well as a full spectrum of fluid analysis, including spill spectrometry, to be able to define composition of the hydrocarbon down all up to 200 degrees C as well. We have many different types of inlet that I will cover, uh, but another element that I want to talk about is um, uh, our flow manager, our pump, that allows us to have a very large flow uh, range in terms of being able to control fluid movement from as low as 0.05 barrel per day to 108 barrel per day. Or if you're in metrics, 0.1 cc per second to 200 cc per second. I prefer the metrics in America. So all of this technology enable um, the Aura platform to reach and provide solution in any type of, uh, of condition from a deep water, ultra tight, high pressure, high temperature environment, and to achieve this with about 50% more efficiency than the legacy technology. This helps reduce cost, cost as well as energy consumption and carbon emission uh, during these phases. Oops, sorry. So now, now that's a test, this is a video function. So I just want to give you a kind of a, a principle of what we call focus sampling. So this innovation came in the mid 2000s to basically try to, uh, one of the big uh, goal of any formation tester is to achieve uh, the cleanest fluid sample from the reservoir. So as you drill a well, uh, you'll use what I call mud, right? So these are fluid that helps keep the well stable, uh, help lubricate the drill bit when you drill, but one of the drawbacks is that it invades the formation. So you have fluids migrating into the formation, and this is what we show here as what we call mud filtrate. And basically, it is kind of a barrier, right? Before you can get to the actual reservoir fluid, you have to blast that. And uh, in typical, so I will have to act it. So um, it's supposed to be a nice video that shows the cone for everything. Um, but basically what will happen with the focus sampling is you have two entry in the, in, in the, in the tool uh, and you act, you act on them uh, at the same time. And what will happen is you'll start seeing a cone of fluid moving uh, toward the probe and the center part of the cone will have uh, reservoir fluid coming faster. And the outer probe will have leftover of mud filtrate. And this technology allows us to achieve clean sample, um, you know, very, with ultimately no contamination, while if you are not using it, you basically will always have a bit of contaminants coming through and never get uh, a clean sample. And it's important, why do you want a clean sample? Because as you do your uh, uh, download fluid uh, analysis, look at your uh, uh, PVT performance, the cleaner the sample, the more representative it will be of what the fluid you have in the reservoir. So it's hugely important uh, to, um, to achieve this type of, of, of fluid, of clean layer. 
So another element that we use to, uh, for formation testing is what we call radial probe. So this is where we maximize the flow area uh, that we uh, have again the formation to maximize the area of flow from the, from the well bore. And why is it important? Um, so you will recognize, some of you will recognize that DAF, DAF is low of uh, fluid within porous media. Um, and you will see that in terms of the, f you know, if you have, uh, we have permeability, which is the rock uh, capability of, of uh, uh, you know, the rock permeability, sorry, combined with solidity, this number is the inverse of mobility, which is a, s uh, a measurement of how easy it is to move the fluid from the reservoir uh, across the reservoir. So what you see is that the, lo the lower the mobility, the higher your flow area needs to be to be able to move uh, fluid. And so as I mentioned earlier, the focus sampling was uh, uh, in the previous slide, we had the focus probe. It was, it was great with mobility from, let's say the medium to the higher mobility. Why? Because the flow area in this case, you're flowing fast enough, it's not becoming such a constraint. But as the mobility goes down, you need a higher flow area. And so that's where this type of probe become prevalent where you maximize the fluid that you can go. So this is really for the lower mobility end of the spectrum. And so when we developed Aura, we wanted to be able to have a tool that works in all environments, from the high to medium mobility to the low mobility. And so we, what we conceptualized is to combine those two phenomena, oops, sorry, those two phenomena to have a large flow area as well as a focus sampling technology. So again, it looks like the video does not see. Yeah, it does not work. <laughs> um, and so in this particular case, uh, you will, uh, the same principle that I explained earlier, where you would focus your clean sample in the center part, so you get very clean sample, and, and have the dirt, let's say dirty sample, uh, maybe, uh, okay, sorry. A dirty sample uh, left on, uh, on the side, right? So this enables to be able to uh, basically get to clean sample or capture sample three to five times faster than what you have in uh, legacy technology. Because technology also has been developed for 200 degrees C and, and went to 100 hours of testing uh, environmental condition to be able to demonstrate its reliability. Um, the final design parameters in terms of placing exactly where we wanted to place these openings uh, was optimized uh, through hundreds of simulations uh, to, ad to adjust the, the the, the geometry to the different type of uh, formation we could um, face. So now, we also need to be able to operate at high temperature, we also need to develop very high um, extreme uh, electronic that works in extreme environment, high temperature electronics. So these are what we call mixed suit module. Uh, and basically in this case, uh, if you were taking um, your phone and trying to, which has a lot of processing power, it's a magic of electronics, if you're putting in an oven at 200 degrees C, it will not really operate well. So, and the reason is because a lot of these chips have plastics around it, right? This is the plastic that they make, so when you have a computer, you open it, you will see motherboard with a bunch of plastic components. The silicium part itself, that's inside, the chip can operate up to 200 degrees, but the packaging does not allow it to do it. So to over that, well, we, uh, we've used a technology that's uh, well known, which is multi-chip module, and we basically take the silicium chip, we place them on the ceramic substrate in a metal encasing, that's filled with, uh, with helium, typically, and that allows us to get rid of the limitation of temperature. Um, so not only have we done that for electronics, but also we wanted, to, uh, we, we wanted to be efficient in our design, our mechanical design. So we develop electronics that can also operate under uh, high pressure, so we can have them connected to, uh, let's say, a motor or to whatever mechanism they were controlling. And so this particular uh, component here uh, is a motor, and then you see here there is a, a multitude module electrical, and this battery component is able to operate at full hydroplastic pressure up to 30,000 psi and 200 degrees C. Let's talk about a bit about the in-situ fluid analysis. So this is, we're very proud <laughs> of this measurement because, as I mentioned, um, there is nobody else in the industry that cap the capable of making this measurement down low at this level of temperature. Everybody else, including our previous technology, would stop at 175 degrees C. So that 25 degrees C is quite important uh, because a lot of our <laughs> next reservoirs, you know, the, 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 as we drill deeper, the temperature increases. And so what we can see is that as we move further down in the exploration, we will see much higher and higher temperature for us to be able to explore this environment and be able to discover all, all that. 
Um, so it includes, it has an accurate uh, and com full comprehensive pre analysis where you can do full composition, color, uh, GR, so gas to oil ratio, uh, fluorescence, um, compressibility, as well as viscosity, density of the fluid. Um, uh, as, and as I mentioned, uh, the uh, first downhole calibrated resistivity center, which is, you see an example here where we actually measured water resistivity from, a reser from an aquifer and compare it uh, with the real lab data and we were within the accuracy range of the lab. Talking about the pump, so as I mentioned, we have the largest uh, flow rate pump uh, in the industry where we can go from a standard 0 0.1 to 120 cc per second or uh, we can extend it to 200 cc per second. It has a, major, a large differential pressure. Why do you need differential pressure? Because as you move um, the formation, uh, you know, remember the, the Darcy law, to be able to move fluid from, res from a from a reservoir, you need to create a depression. And that depression is also proportional to the permeability of that formation. Um, we've developed the electronic high power, the high power electronic to operate this at fully at 200 degrees C. And we have extremely high control that allows us to control this flow rate uh, to the point where we are able to make sure we never cross any phase transition as we produce uh, the hydrocarbon. So I talked to you about the, the technology a bit, and now I'm going to talk to you about a bit about the application. So before I go to that, uh, you know, so we, we all know that we are currently, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the phase of transitioning our energy sources. Uh, and one of the drivers for that is we want to contain climate change. Um, and the EIA has predicted that if we want to contain it and keep it uh, the uh, the uh, temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees C, we need to uh, reach net zero carbon emission by 2050. In order to achieve that, uh, you need to start having, you know, this depression, this uh, reduction in carbon emission immediately, and we need to reach 40% reduction by 2030. At the same time, so this is what we call the dual challenge. While we have this mandate or requirement to decrease our carbon emission, we also need to grow, we expect our, our economy to grow 40%. That means that our energy demand will also grow about the same amount, right? And so it's critical that not only, you know, the, we looked at electrifying our, our means of transportation, uh, finding new ways to uh, produce uh, energy, decarbonize energy, but as we transition, uh, we will need to be able to support this growth. And a lot of that growth will also come from oil and gas. So it's important for the oil and gas itself to look toward decarbonization. And this is an example of how we can use EORA to help reduce uh, the carbon emission that is happening while we're doing, uh, you know, um, investigation for oil and gas. Uh, and one example is uh, when we, uh, we, we have, uh, with our technology, our high flow rate, our precise equipment, we can replace with our EORA uh, technology what we call a drill stem test, which is essentially a pretest of producing a reservoir where you have to move fluid from the reservoir and produce it to the surface. And usually what you do with the oil or hydrocarbon that you receive on the surface, you, pour, you burn it because you, cannot, uh, you don't have the infrastructure to actually, uh, thanks. Uh, you don't have the infrastructure to actually um, uh, produce it and bring it to the, to, to the user. Um, and so this is really, you know, very, uh, very consuming in terms of emission uh, and energy. So with Aura, we're able to achieve similar type of measurement, not completely. We're not able to replace it completely, but in a lot of cases, we're able to provide enough information that you will not need to do a DSC. And an example on the right is uh, showing the type of saving you can have uh, when uh, using Aura. So if you were using, in this particular example, that's an actual example of a job that we did in West Africa. If you were gonna do a conventional DST, it would take about, for testing one zone, it was about two weeks to complete about, you will produce about 3,000 barrels a day of oil that you will have to burn, while with OR, you could do the same in one day of logging and eliminating all the, uh, the, the flare requirement, burning of gas requirement. So saving in, in effect over 96% of carbon emission. Okay, so another area where we feel that formation testing can play a role and aura in particular is in the area of carbon capture and storage. So all, a lot of the uh, oil and gas industry, we have used the reservoir to produce it. And a lot of these reservoirs now 
are depleted, and we are looking at ways that we can use them as storage for uh, carbon that we would recover uh, from, from the atmosphere, right? And that's another element of being able to get to not net zero emission. Not only do you have to reduce your, your emissions, but you also have to find a way to recapture some of these carbon that has been uh, left in the atmosphere and be able to store it. And one uh, element where we are using AURA is uh, when we look at different reservoirs, some of the reservoirs that are most prone for carbon storage are the uh, saline aquifer. So these are water, more brine aquifer that are not suitable for, um, for water consumption, but can be used to dissolve CO2 and store the CO2 in mass, in mass amounts. Um, and so with AURA, as I mentioned, we were able to uh, characterize the fluid that are in the rocks, in particular water, because we're able to clean all the substrates, all the filtrate, and get to the actual uh, clean water that is inside of the reservoir, and we can actually measure it in situ. And in this case, identify those reservoirs that are uh, good for, um, uh, for carbon storage or not. So I will conclude with a few examples of feedback that we have from our customers. So here for um, Talos Energy, we're able to provide them in, uh, immediate information for in terms of fluid analysis that allows them to optimize uh, within, you know, within days their, uh, their development plan uh, while it would have taken several weeks or maybe months uh, before that. In Mexico for Pemex, uh, we're able to identify in an area where we have ultra tight uh, reservoirs, so very difficult to produce a fluid. We're able to demonstrate the presence of gas, uh, both on the top and the bottom of the reservoir, uh, leading to the largest land discovery in Mexico in the last 25 years. So, Aura has been used in many places, and these are a few examples. So we have over 100 jobs to date, actually 150 as of today. Um, and uh, we've tested this technology across many different environments from high pressure, high temperature, from the Gulf of Mexico, deep water, to the land of, uh, of uh, the Middle East. And every time we'll be able to show a new benchmark in terms of performance, uh, delivering um, you know, the solution for our customer in, uh, more efficiently uh, with reduced risk and energy consumption. So in summary, the Aura platform provides a step change in technology for wireline information testing, achieving better quality sample and faster in situ characterization in all type of condition. And we also believe it enable new application that would reduce carbon emission in during oil and gas exploration and appraisal process. So I want to acknowledge all my collaborators that work with me at Schlumberger. There are many and not enough space on the slide to be able to list them all uh, from the people that contributed directly to uh, advisors that provided feedback on design and applications um, uh, and, and other operators that actually use the tool for us in, in the operation. I want also to recognize our customer, early customers that actually try out that technology uh, for their field. Thank you and uh, welcome any questions. Th thank you, Mr. Partush, for an excellent presentation and uh, amazing advancements in fire line formation technology. Just for the benefit of the audience, you know, the Technology Innovation Award requires not only an impressive innovation uh, in that's developed in Texas, but also it requires commercialization and successful application in the field. So uh, thank you for sharing with, with our audience here the, the many successful applications of your technology around the world. So. Any questions? I see one already. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Deb Banerjee from Texas A&M. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, very impressive uh, presentation, and I'm kind of intrigued about two things. If I could uh, ask you to elaborate a little bit sure. more. Uh, the first one is you mentioned about this uh, electronics that's operating at uh, 200 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. These are fabricated using CMOS process, or is it fabricated using a different process? So yeah. <laughs> You asked the question, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I focus this on the packaging. Um, uh, it's, it's using, um, uh, I couldn't tell you exactly which specific technology or process we do, but it's really, uh, you know, a real known industrial process for, uh, for packaging. So we use, uh, um, you know, industrial partners to, to develop that. Okay, okay, because my next question would be what node size and so on. 
So we will we'll get away from that question then. <laughs> the, the coming to more like a mechanical engineering question, so you mentioned that you know you are doing these measurements under supercritical conditions. Mm -hmm. So you are operating in an environment where there is huge oscillations in density, thermal conductivity, viscosity, and so on. Uh, so how are you able to determine the mass flow rate when things are fluctuating so wildly when you're going from supercritical to subcritical state? So, so usually, um, I would say we are trying not to be in the supercritical phase. Uh, we're trying to stay within the uh, reservoir environment condition. Um, and so, in this particular case, in the measurement that we see, we, you know, it's at a macro level, right? So we don't go to the microscopic level that my colleagues are looking into. So we don't see that much uh, variability. And actually, it is quite, uh, we can see a lot of quite repellability. An example, actually, uh, was water, uh, albeit, but we could see very repeatable measurement from sensors to sensors at the same data point uh, in, in the well bore. Um, and so the different type of measurement we do, we're really l staying at the macro level and we're not going to that lower level uh, of, uh, I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still kind of intrigued, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you will see a voltage signal, let's say, from your sensor. But how do you interpret it as to how much the mass flow rate is? So, so, we, so the measurement that we do, right, uh, we look at uh, spectroscopy. So this is uh, uh, carbon phases, right? So uh, we looked at the dispersion of, of, of uh, the light through um, through the fluid, and based on that, we can detect the number, you know, how much C1, C2, C3, C6 have been achieved. We have more physical sensors like density and viscosity. Right. And so these are using, um, you know, proprietary measurement, you know, uh, you know, mechanical system to measure that. So, for example, our density is based on uh, a vibration to, as to, you know, the, the change in vibration due to the change in density is then uh, backtracked into measuring the actual density of the fluid. Thank you. Thanks.